1962 Beatles, Dr. Goldman. What do you think? Um, I'm just with John. I remember seeing him on Ed Sullivan, and I stood online to see Dr. No. Oh, nice. <laughs> so you got well, you got experience with both. Sweet. What was your favorite James Bond movie? I know you are a closet cinephile based on the text that we've had. <laughs> My favorite James Bond movie. Um, well, obviously, they had, they had that strong Connery in it. Um, I thought Dr. No was one of the best, easily. Um, some people think From Russia With Love was the best. Okay, I'll go with, I'll go with those. Which one had Odd Job? Odd Job? Was that Thunderball? No, that's, that's Goldfinger. Goldfinger. I told you he was a cinephile. <laughs> <laughs> he, he knows his movies, baby. Uh, Dr. Goldman was on with us about six weeks ago. He was doing a uh, talk at Shepherd University at the time where he is an adjunct professor as well. And uh, he has a new book out as well, which is called One More War to Fight the Union Veterans Battle for Equality Through Reconstruction, Jim Crow and the Lost Cause, which we discussed in a previous appearance. You've got a couple more appearances coming up in the area, too, in the region. Uh, where will you be, Dr. Goldman? Um, well, tonight I'm going to be at the uh, Red Brick Courthouse in downtown Rockville. And um, I'm talking about a subject which is quite near and dear to my heart, the Freedmen's Bureau. And um, I'm including information which I think will be kind of interesting uh, for folks, not just in Maryland, but also West Virginia, because people may not realize that the Freedmen's Bureau was also in Maryland and West Virginia. It was not, um, it's, it's just exclusively in the former Confederate states. What is the Freedmen's Bureau? The Freedmen's Bureau was established. Mm. Um, actually before the end of the war. It was only designed to be in existence for one year to enable the newly freed people, all, all four million of them, to transition into freedom. And it was a purely military operation, uh, which meant it was very poorly funded. Um, it turned out to be probably the most important um, organization of Reconstruction because of the work it did to both protect the rights of um, free African Americans, but in particular, it, the tremendous work it did on education uh, through the Freedom Schools. And, you know, it's quite a story. And uh, a fair amount of my book is devoted to the activities of the Freedmen's Bureau. And again, not just in the former Confederate states, but in the border states such as Maryland and West Virginia, uh, in addition to that. You can uh, get a good uh, um, look at what Dr. Goldman has uh, been working on at his website, stephenagoldmanmd.com, by the way, stephenagoldmanmd.com, to get information on this and some other things as well. You're also going to be at the Seabirds Library, Library in uh, Frederick this weekend, correct? Yeah, I'll be there Saturday, Saturday afternoon, and they had me give a talk that has been one of my most popular over the years about uh, the psychological impact of war. And it's also one of my favorite topics because it gives me an opportunity to talk about the full duality of having been in combat and the aspect that... Um, is not talked about nearly as much as the horrors of war is the thrill of having been in combat. And this is something that is a tough subject in a lot of ways, because it is no way to certainly suggest that war is a desirable means of solving problems. But when one works with veterans, as has been my privilege over the decades, is you have to understand that having survived combat, that for those who have been to war, it's the absence of war in many circumstances that's more difficult to deal with than having been to war, because what do you do next after you've survived combat? And um, it, it's, as I say, it's a fascinating topic. It's one I've been not just researching, but certainly working with veterans over the years. So. I try and give, as I do in the, in the book on, in my book on Reconstruction and race after the Civil War, to give the full picture. 
I mean, you have to basically play it straight down the line and talk about all the aspects that you have, and there's nothing that is more protean than war itself. I mean, there's so many aspects that are involved with it. And from a psychiatric standpoint, psychological standpoint, um, what happens when people return and make the transition from um, being in the service to being civilians? And I've, again, I've been very lucky to have worked on those aspects. I did that for the VA and uh, continue to work with veterans groups. John Gilstrap. Yeah, I would think that having been a first responder for 15 years back in the day, um, you know, firefighters hang around with firefighters because things that are, are funny in that community are not are, uh, repulsive outside of the community. There's a, a language that is spoken among first responders, and I can only imagine that that's, that's the way it is among uh, people who have, who have not only been to war, but went to war and survived in a cadre of, of very close brothers, for lack of a better term. And I would imagine, the, the question mark at the end of this, I, I would imagine that that is missed as much as anything else, is, is that cadre of friends who have literally saved each other's lives. You know, that's a great, that's a great analogy. That, that's absolutely dead on. Um, when we talk about PTSD, which I think, as I mentioned the last time, is the great predominance of men and women who have been to war do not end up with PTSD. And one of the things that's, very, that's really parallel with first responders and with um, veterans of war is they're one of the few, they're two of the few groups that would return to these incredibly um, potent psychological situations because the, of the emotions involved. And even those who, who have been diagnosed with PTSD, whether they're first responders or veterans, many of them, if not, frankly, the majority, say they would never have missed the experience. They would never, they, if, they had been, if they had known and been given a choice of whether they would have undergone what they did, they, the answer would have been yes. So that's, that's, a def, that's absolutely right. The second aspect you're talking about is what people who have undergone, who have had these experiences, they do have their own language. They do have their own experiences. And it's, as you know, it's not easy to break into that if you are not someone who's experienced it yourself. Having been a psychiatrist working at the VA um, and working with veterans, I've been honored to be brought into that community and that's why I feel such an obligation to tell the stories accurately because of what I've learned and, and what I've been privy to and trying to explain exactly as you're pointing out. And um, you know, one of the great examples of this are some of the books and talks that came out of 9-11, what happened with both uh, the fire department and the police department in New York City and what the experience was after 9-11 for those first responders. And, um, and again, I'm John, I'm wondering if this resonates with you. People expected so many of the folks to resign from either the police department or the, um, the firefighters, but they didn't. I wasn't surprised, but other people were, because the bonds are so tight and the community is so important that I wouldn't have even I wouldn't have even imagined they would have left either of the departments for two reasons. They were the survivors and secondly somebody someone had to carry on. And who would be better than the people who would then rise in the ranks because of course they lost so many people in, in both the departments. So that that's a that's a great point that you're making. Has anybody evaluated, going back to the, the era of the Civil War and the immediate aftermath, in terms of PTSD, which is I was not called that at the time, obviously, but I can't imagine the impact on the non-soldiers, the people on whose property 
the battles happened or through whose property the soldiers merely marched and took everything, you know, ate all the corn, took all the animals, <clears throat> stole all the horses or or, or took all the, the, the horses. Has anybody looked at the impact, the emotional impact that that has had on those families and moving forward? That would be an interesting study. Well, um, it's been hard enough to study the impact on the men who fought the war. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the only psychiatrist who's actually, the card-carrying psychiatrist who's actually looked at the incidence uh, and prevalence of that within a sample, which is actually going to be one of my upcoming books. Um, l- let's, let's be clear here about a couple of things. Post-traumatic stress disorder, which of course existed during the Civil War, wasn't called that, as you point out, although let me clear up one um misconception. There was something called Soldier's Heart that was during the Civil War, and that has been called by people who, frankly, are not mental health workers as the equivalent of PTSD. Well, it wasn't. It was actually uh, had much more in common what we would now classify as panic disorder. And when you look at the available data that we have, the symptomatology is very similar. So now we have the modern nomenclature PTSD, but it clearly existed. There's no evidence that there was a higher incidence uh, during the Civil War of any other war. Now, among civilians, that's, that's, of course, a very different story. And there was not much um, physical violence towards civilians. I do want to point that out. Even though this was a Civil War that particularly in the last year of the war, was fought no holes barred between the men of the Union and the Confederacy, particularly since African-American troops were involved. But there was not a lot of violence towards civilians, although there were rapes and other violent crimes, but there was not a great number of them. You're absolutely right that there was, on both sides, taking of property, and of course during um, Sheridan's Shenandoah campaign, that's what he did. He burned out what was in the Shenandoah Valley as a war aim, and that was stated. I'm not familiar with any systematic look at the repercussions of that from a, from a psychological standpoint. I do know that um, there are stories about people trying to get reimbursed by the federal government from damage that was caused during the battles that were fought literally on ground like at Gettysburg and Monocacy, and they, there were very few examples of people being reimbursed. So people were financially destroyed by the war um, in terms of property. You're absolutely right. You know, it was a civil war, and it was being fought for the, the, the very soul of the United States. So um, it's not surprising that particularly in the Eastern Theater, and of course in the in the in the other theater, in the Western Theater, uh, Sherman's march to the sea. He had no supply lines, so he was using supplies from the population. Of course, he was also destroying every railroad he could with the famous Sherman ties, where they would superheat the rails and then wrap them around the tree. Again, war aims. But I do want to again reiterate that for the most part, there was no violence against civilians. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Dr. Goodman. Um, so I have to draw, think about in my world where I'm a prosecuting attorney. So you have these, you talked about these potent psychological uh, situations that the people who had experienced that, they had no regrets about about experiencing it and they had a readiness to, to go back and experience it. I, do you think that that could uh, explain some of the high recidivism rates with inmates coming out of out of prisons? I would I would not make the analogy between men and women who have been to war and recidivism for crime. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't make that analogy for a couple of reasons. Okay. Um, let's start with the Civil War. The men of the Union, white and black were fighting not just to maintain a republic, but to destroy an institution which was destroying the United States. 
And by the way, I, I didn't say they didn't have regrets. I said that they would want to return to a circumstance they found to be remarkable and unique. There's a concept that we look at now called moral injury. There's a whole literature now of moral injury. And one of the things that we have found over the decades is that um, combatants, you know, people who've been to war, that moral injury is much less likely to occur if you're fighting for a cause that is of, of value, if you don't commit an act of a, uh, if you don't commit an act that is considered an atrocity, that's why when I when I speak about killing in war, I make the distinction because there are different types of killing in war, and there's a difference between obviously committing an atrocity than killing in battle. So there's a difference there. In terms of recidivism, when it comes to um, criminal behavior, that's a different, and again, that's, that's your belly work. That's a different experience than having been to war for reasons that are valid and for things of which they are proud. They're not the same. Dr. Goldman, I have heard that one of the greatest um, sources, not sources, the, some of the most af affected people with, uh, with PTSD in our military are the drone pilots. The, the folks who are sitting in, in Omaha and, and driving drones and, and um, killing people without skin in the game, you know, with, without themselves being in danger. Has, is that just urban legend or has that been your experience? Yeah, um, that, that's a terrific question also. Um, you may recall that there was a controversy when there was, I, I think it was a proposal to award medals, combat medals, to people who were not actually in combat, particularly drones. And there was an uproar about that. And they decided not to do that. And that is very different than the experience of actually being in combat for reasons you can imagine. And again, apropos of, of what we're discussing, when there's this Differences in circumstances. One of the most affected uh, people in terms of war are prisoners of war. And their experience is very different than those who have been in combat and do not become prisoners of war. And they have a tougher time coming home. Now, of course, we remember from the Vietnam War, people who came back after, after years, like being in the Hanoi Hilton and others, uh, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, also has very good data about the difference between the very low incidence of PTSD in their combat troops versus a higher incidence of PTSD associated with people, with um, soldiers and other service personnel who have been in, in prisons of war, have been prisons of war. Since the drones is a fairly new technology and a new modality of war, that is something to monitor as to whether. Um, that that experience, which is far removed from being in combat, because again, just like with with first responders, you're with other people. You're in a circumstance where you're depending on someone else for their lives. That is not the same situation when you're working a drone or something else. And people in the military are concerned about this because this is a new type of war. And it's a different experience, and you're absolutely right that this is something, and again, I haven't got great data on this that I'm, that I'm aware of yet, but that's something that people are going to have to watch because war has changed. Having said that, we're watching a war in the Ukraine that looks just like every other conventional type war, and we're seeing some very similar things there that we've seen throughout history. Uh, this has been a a fascinating interest to me in particular because I've got a nephew that just got out of the Marine Corps a year ago or so, and he was part of a an extraction unit that would go into dangerous areas with bad guys and get good people out. And once he got out of the Marine Corps, I was fascinated to hear that he was, you know, within a year considering 
uh, joining a contract group to go and do the exact same work. And I couldn't understand exactly how he would want to put himself voluntarily right back into that same situation. And this kind of really explains that. And in absence of actually doing that, he has thrown himself uh, full force into becoming an EMT. And he's kind of right right back into that uh, adrenaline junkie business, Dr. Goldman. Well, I mean, and again, that that's a terrific point. I mean, uh, are you folks familiar with the movie Hurt Locker? Yes. Mm-hmm. Do you remember how it ends? No. Does he kill himself? No, he does not. Oh. Now, again, the character that is one of the main characters he diffuses bombs, oh. particularly the IEDs. The end of the film, he's back in the states, but he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna re up. That's right. That's right. Yep. Hey, on that uh, note, okay. we're just we're just about out of time. We've got about twenty seconds left. How can people find out more about the work that you've been doing, Doctor Goldman? Um, the website. <laughs> uh, come to the lectures, buy the book, and um, this is stuff that. Uh, again, I love, uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to discuss this with, with folks who are very tuned in. And um, those, are, those are the three ways, and I'm always glad to discuss this. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Have a great day. You too.